years ago, I watched the uh, story of Gettysburg on TV, and I became fascinated by the fact that General Lee, Robert E. Lee, commander of the Army of the uh, North Virginia, would send his men across a mile-wide battlefield to certain death on the third day of the battle. As I sat and watched that movie, I tried to figure out now why would General Lee, a great Southern general, do something like that? It was almost certain suicide for these men to go across there. So I started doing some reading, and I read about 10 different books on the Battle of Gettysburg. I like historical drama. Braveheart's my favorite movie of all time. I even have a book about the life of William Wallace that I got from Scotland. I like Gettysburg. I like movies like that have to do with fact. And... Um, so I'm going to give you three books that you might want to write down in case you're interested in doing some reading. The first book is called The Killer Angels by Shara, S-H-A-A-R-A. -A -A. And it's kind of a novel about the Battle of Gettysburg. It goes along with the movie. It's not really, it's not technical like High Tide at Gettysburg. But it's a good starter book. Another classic book on Gettysburg is called Gettysburg by Haskell and Oates. Haskell and Oates were officers in the Confederate and Union forces, so they told their story, their perspective of the Battle of Gettysburg. And then the third book is a big, thick book called High Tide at Gettysburg by Glenn Tucker. And it's probably more than you want to know about the Battle of Gettysburg, but it's very, very detailed. It tells you a lot of good stuff about the battle. So this would be a good one to start with if you're interested in some more reading. Gettysburg, what has to know it's High Tide at Gettysburg. Now the idea of high tide is kind of an analogy to floodwaters. A lot of people lived along rivers, so the floods would rise up and would reach what we call high tide in the flooding, and then the flood would start to recede. Well, that's exactly what the Battle of Gettysburg was for the Confederacy. It was their high water mark, their high tide. After they lost the Battle of Gettysburg, they still fought for another year and a half or two years, but the Confederates began to lose the war. The Battle of Gettysburg was the critical battle, the most critical battle, in the battle of the Civil War, four-year Civil War. Had the Confederates won, I talked to a reenactor, I went to Gettysburg and took a tour and that kind of thing. Had the Confederates won, this one reenactor said we would have a split country, we'd have two governments, one would have a government in Washington, D.C. for the North, and the other would be, where do you think? What was the capital of the Confederacy? Richmond, Virginia. He said that we would still have a split country. Had the Confederacy won the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, I went there on, I took a trip with my brother and my youngest son on July 1 through 4, 1995, about four years ago, and uh, actually went to the battlefield, took the tour, you know, walked around. They, had a re they have a reenactment on the same dates, July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, every year. They have a big reenactment. Guys get all dressed up and they camp out and they cook out in tents and they get out on the battlefield and shoot muskets for each other. Not real muskets, balls, you know, but kind of like the charge and the smoke and the cannons and the horses and the trumpets and drums and it's pretty cool. So if you ever want to go to Gettysburg, um, you might want to go on that weekend of July 1st, 2nd, 3rd so you can see actual reenactment of the battle. Um, just by way of introduction, some things before we start talking over here on this one map. Uh, the Emancipation Proclamation had been given on January 1st, 1863, freeing slaves, and yet the, the war would go on for another almost two years. Who was the president of the Confederacy? Does anybody know? Yes? Uh, John Davis. Who? John Davis. Not John Davis, you're Jefferson. close. Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson Davis. Now, one thing you need to know about these guys that fought at Gettysburg and fought on the side of the Confederacy and the Union, they were friends. Most of them had gone to West Point Academy training for the Army, and so they knew each other from college days. They were, some of them were the same age, and also they had fought together for the United States against uh, in the Mexican War. So most of these guys, and you're going to see a scene in the movie, you may have seen it already, I don't think so yet, but there's a guy that's a general on the Confederate side, and he wants to go over and visit his friend on the night before the third day battle on the Union side. And they make that arrangement for him to go over and visit his friend. Because he had this sense of impending doom that maybe he was going to be killed in the battle. 
and he wanted to say farewell to his friend. And you'll see that in the movie. Um, Stonewall Jackson, General Robert E. Lee's right-hand man, most valiant warrior on the battlefield, was killed at the, ba excuse me, at the Battle of Chancellorsville, and I think that was a key element, which I'll explain later. General Stonewall Jackson was a great general. He was out riding one night, kind of looking over the troops in the battlefield for the next day, late at night, and his own troops mistook him for an enemy soldier and shot him and killed him. So he was killed by friendly fire. Another thing that you need to know as a way of introduction, the guy that was leading the Union troops was General Joe Hooker. Here's Washington, D.C. down here at the Capitol, Lincoln, President. And General Hooker was commander of the Army of the Potomac. He got into a squabble with President Lincoln over something, and just kind of in a way of bluff and kind of being stubborn, he offered his uh, resignation. Well, his, to his surprise, President Lincoln took it. And three days before the Battle of Gettysburg, President Lincoln appointed General George Meade. In my opinion, of the reading I've done of people I've talked to, if General Joe Hooker had been the commander at the Battle of Gettysburg, the Union forces would have lost. But General Meade was a much better general. Let's talk about Gettysburg real quick. Gettysburg's a a little town back in those days, 1863, of about 2,500 people. They did not plan to fight at Gettysburg. They didn't say, oh, we're going to have a battle at Gettysburg. What happened was, and I'll kind of explain this more in detail, General Lee's men came into Gettysburg to find shoes. Because they'd been marching a lot, and they'd worn out their shoes, so they, could, they heard there was a shoe factory there. So they came in. The only problem is they ran into John Buford and his cavalry troops there, and uh, the battle started. But the, the thing about it was that it had, I don't know if I've drawn all the roads on here, but you can see the different roads. There were like 12 different roads that intersected at Gettysburg. Now, men in those days, they couldn't march through the woods. That was too hard and torturous. They couldn't climb all the fences between all the fields. So where did they march? What were, their, what were their avenues or the routes of marching? They marched down the roads. So Gettysburg was a very key place. Now, Gettysburg's in Pennsylvania. Below that is Maryland, where the capital city of Baltimore. And then down here is Washington, D.C. Um, so. Let me explain, explain what General Lee was doing. Now, General Lee is the commander of the Army of Northern Virginia, which is down here. He decided to come up into the north. One of the reasons he came into the north, the, country, the state of Virginia, which he was from, was so devastated by the war they couldn't find any food for the soldiers. So they thought, well, we'll go up north and invade Pennsylvania, and you know, a lot of farms, a lot of cows, a lot of food, and we'll just kind of forage and kind of live that way. They also wanted to come up here and capital the city of Carlisle, Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, which is the capital, drop down and capture Baltimore, Maryland, and come in and capture Washington, D.C. When General Lee advanced to the north, he had already gone to President Jefferson Davis and laid a battle plan on his desk, which said, our plan is to capture Harrisburg, Baltimore, and Washington, D.C. and win the war. So that's what General Lee was attempting to do. He came up behind the screen of the Blue Ridge Mountains. There's a lot of, a lot of big and little mountains in here. I just kind of drew it as a way of explanation. So he was on the other side here and using this as a screen so that he couldn't be attacked. And he was headed for Carlisle and Harrisburg. I got here, his men came into Gettysburg looking for shoes, and that's when the first day battle started. Now, one of the important factors that you need to know, and this is to me a critical factor of why they lost the Battle of Gettysburg, was that General Jeb Stuart, J-E-B-S-T-U-A-R-T. Jeb Stuart. He had 10,000 cavalry men on horses underneath his command. He decided, right before this battle began, about five days before the battle began, Come around here, kind of have a little skirmish here in Washington. Come around here, 
And about right over here somewhere, or maybe it was just a little bit north in Pennsylvania, he captured a wagon train of supplies of 150 wagons. Well, did that speed him up or slow him down? Slow him down. So he kind of got stuck over here. He should have been over here helping General Lee. Instead, he was way over here. Now, you need to understand how cavalry was used in those days. It's like jet planes today. What do jet planes do? They fly out and, and do what? Well, attack, attack or reconnaissance or kind of find out what the enemy's strength is and what's going on, and they fly back. Well, men on horses could cover 50 to 100 miles in one day. So they could, what General Lee needed was men to come over here and find out what Hooker was doing and come back, or come out and shoot the gaps here between the mountains and come back. Well, they weren't there, so they were, they were kind of marching blind. Have you seen the first part of the movie where General Buford comes in and rides in with his officers, the cavalry? And they see those Union or Confederate forces marching down the road. Have you seen that part of the movie? Mm -hmm. And what does one of his officers say? He says, that's strange. Confederate infantry marching without cavalry in front of them. Because they wouldn't do that. They were marching blind. They were marching unprotected. Now, infantry could do about 30 miles a day. That's like, well, that's like starting here at Lincoln Middle School, walking downtown Indianapolis and walking back. Would that be a long walk for most of us? They could do 30 miles a day, but the cavalry could do, of course, if they're on horses, they could do a lot more. But again, Jeb Stewart was way over here somewhere, galley mounting around, messing around, and he should have been over here helping General Lee. Okay, any questions on anything so far? Any comments, questions, anything you want to know about? Okay. Now, the first day of battle was July 1st, 1863. Here's Gettysburg. Here's all the roads leading in. General Lee's men had decided to then start marching down the roads in between the mountains there. And they were here, coming from the west, the north, and the northeast into Gettysburg. Well, the problem is they ran into John Buford and his 7,000 cavalrymen. Now, you say, well, how could they defend a city with, let's say there's 30,000 infantry coming? 7,000 cavalry. Well, what they tried to do was to slow them down or stack them up so they just wouldn't come in. And they knew that when their troops came from behind, you know, Meade and his Union troops, that they could defend this ridge south of Gettysburg and called the high ground. That was the objective. But what he did was he lined up his cavalrymen over here and stacked them up and slowed them down so they couldn't take the high ground. Now, let's talk about high ground, low ground. Who has the advantage? The person on the high ground or the person on the low ground? What? Why? They can what? They can charge downwards. Well, they can charge downwards. It's a lot easier than charging uphill, right? Yes. It takes less energy. And why? Why would it be a good battlefield? Okay, you're on the high ground, you can see more. Or if you're if you're down on the low ground and you're looking up, you can't see what's going on behind the truth. That's a good point. What's another point? Do you think the high ground is very important? No? Yeah. They have to march up the hill. And that takes a lot more time and energy. You can shoot down on them and hit them a lot easier than Yeah. You're firing down on them. You're, you're kind of like standing still firing down on them. It's a lot easier to do that than them marching up the hill firing at you. So the objective on the first day of battle, John Buford, who, by the way, is my personal hero at the uh, Battle of Gettysburg. I've got a book about his life, um, and, and that's you know really neat. Sam Elliott, the guy that plays him in the movie. Anybody who knows Sam Elliott? He's my one of my favorite actors of all time. He's great. So John Buford stacked him up here and did not let them get the high ground. Now, let's say that the Confederates got the high ground here, and here comes the Union troops. Who do you think would have won the Battle of Gettysburg? The, the, Confederates. the Confederates. Because they would have been stationed here, and the Union troops would have had to come up the hill to attack them. Now, since he stacks them up, and, and General Meade and some of his officers can come up here. Now, one of the things that happened on this day, and, and I don't think you've maybe seen this in the movie, Coming up here with his troops is um, Reynolds, General Reynolds. He leads what they call the Black Hats from Wisconsin 
in Indiana, some men from Indiana fought the Battle of Gettysburg, okay? They're called the Black Hats. Well, General Reynolds then comes up to support John Buford and his cavalry so they can retreat and take this high ground. The only problem was that General Reynolds rode into the battle a uh, Confederate sharpshooter. Now, what they did with these sharpshooter guys, they didn't go out and line up and shoot. They'd hide in trees or on rocks or on high places, and they'd see these generals coming down the road, and they'd pick them off. They were called sharpshooters. They didn't fight. They just hit them and shot them. Well, if you shoot the general, what happens? What happens to the troops? They get confused, and it's easier to defeat them. So they knocked him off. Now, the guy that took over for him was General Abner Doubleday. Does anybody recognize the name Abner Doubleday? Anybody play baseball? Some of you do. Some of you used to, maybe. He's the guy that invented baseball. And they say that he invented the game of baseball during the Civil War when the troops would have free time. He invented the game of baseball and they started playing and started making the rules. So General Reynolds on the first day is killed. After Double Day takes over, the troops retreat. General Meade, who took over for Hooker, comes in and they occupy this, this high ground position here. Confederates are over here on this side of the town. Now, one of the things that happened during uh, the first day battle is that uh, John Burns, you need to write this name down, John Burns, 70 years old, the only civilian to fight in the Battle of Gettysburg. Now, John Burns lived in uh, Gettysburg. That's his hometown. So he decided he was going to defend it. So he got his musket out be fighting and he'd all of a sudden show up at this battle and he'd go home and eat dinner and he'd come back and fight over here a little while. The only problem was he was wounded three times. Seventy years old now, he's fighting for his hometown. Now here's what happened on the third time he got wounded. He's at home, he's laying in his bed, and he's, he's laying in his bed, his Confederate officers come in to question him to say, were you fighting in the battle? Why'd they want to know? He's fighting for the Union. Yeah, they're going to kill him. If he said yes, they're going to kill him. So he said no. They left. And just at precise moment, he turned sideways on his bed like this to get more comfortable from the pain of being wounded. And a bullet comes through the wall or the door and strikes the bed right behind him. So the officers that had just questioned him tried to kill him. And he survived. And there's a statue there, John Burns. Uh, the only civilian to fight in the Battle of Gettysburg, 70 years old. Okay, any questions on day one? Battle of day one? Who has the advantage? What, what's going on here? Can you tell me? I have a question. Okay, question. Go ahead. Um, what was that guy who took place of? Abner Doubleday. I'll put it over here. Doubleday. Mm -hmm. Abner Doubleday, the guy who invented baseball. Okay? So who has the advantage on the first day? The North. They're on this ridge over here. They've defreed, defreed it to this ridge. Okay, day two. Yes? Oh, I have a question on day one. So you think like General Meade like went to the high ground and the and the general Lee or the Confederates had to go around and then fight them? Okay. General Meade and his troops set up, and they call it the fish hook. It's kind of a fish hook shape here on this ridge, which is called Seminary Ridge. General Lee's men then congregated kind of in a fish hook, kind of mirrored them across the battlefield of the city on what they called Cemetery Ridge. There's a mile gap between these two ridges, flat field. So the Confederates are over here, the Union's are over here. Yes. I think she's asking about that line, the Bond Street. That oh, here? Yeah, the line drawn from okay. down. All right, let me explain that. I forgot that. General Longstreet, who is the top warrior now since Stonewall Jackson was gone, top uh, general for Robert E. Lee, decided that they should come down and come around and outflank them and kind of sneak around here and kind of come on the back side of Meade and his troops 
and get between them and Washington somewhere. So who would have to attack then? Who would be defending and who would be attacking? The Union would have to then come back to Washington and attack the Confederates who were in a good position between them and Washington, D.C., okay? So General Longstreet wanted to do that. Lee said, no way. He said he didn't want to divide his forces that way. Stuart was over here messing around, and he didn't want General Longstreet over here. And plus, somebody asked me last period, do you think they could have done it? I don't think they could have snuck around, because remember, they had cavalry here who could have gone out and come back and gone out and come back and found out what they were doing. So there's no way, I, I don't think they could have snuck around like that. Okay, any other questions? Those are good questions. Okay, day two. Seminary Ridge, this is Union. Meade has 60,000 men under his command. Across the field is Cemetery Ridge. General Lee has 50,000 men. Now, one of the things that happened on day two of the battle was that General Lee, at about 11 o'clock in the morning, gave Longstreet a command to come down here and fight. And here was the objective. Longstreet was to come march down here with his troops and come up on the left flank of the Union and then some of his other officers were going to come around and fly, outflank him on this side and they would come around behind and come around from the ends if they could defeat him here and just kind of squeeze him in the middle and defeat him at the Battle of Gettysburg. That was Lee's plan. That was his strategy. Well, General Longstreet was kind of a stubborn guy and he did not think that was a good plan because he wanted to do other things but he'd come way around here and outflank him. So he drug his feet and took his time and he didn't get down here until four o'clock in the afternoon. Well, that's five hours. It could have taken him two hours to march his troops that three miles down here. The, the battlefield was about three miles long. And so they finally got down here about four o'clock in the afternoon and started the attack. Well, here was their plan. There's two little, two little hills down here at the bottom of the Union forces called Big Round Top and Little Round Top. You'll see it in the movie. Defending Big Round Top is Colonel Joshua Chamberlain and the 20th Maine. Now, had Longstreet's forces been able to defeat them on this hill, they could have wiped out the Union Army. Colonel Chamberlain rallies his men and they win the battle. Colonel Chamberlain was a college professor, so he was smart, and he outsmarted the Confederate forces that were attacking him on this hill. And you'll see it in the movie. And then he, they run out of bullets. Here these, and, and you know how they fought in those days? I mean, you've seen enough Civil War movies. Did they, did they do like uh, in World War II, where they, you know, they're like 250, 300 yards apart, and they're lobbing stuff over? And no, how far were they apart, apart from each other? About like that, about 20, 30 yards, maybe less, 20 yards. And they get down on their knees, they fire, they load, fire, load, fire, guys behind them fire. I wouldn't have stood down and done that. I'm glad I wasn't born in that town, I'll tell you the honest truth. I don't think I'd have had the guts or the courage to stand there and say, okay, I'm shooting at you, but go ahead and shoot at me too. And maybe kill me. I don't want to try to kill you first. I wouldn't like that. That's not the way we fight it. So anyway, Longstreet's men attack. Colonel Chamberlain, the college professor, outsmarts him. He spoke seven languages. Um, he was eventually the president of Bodine College in Maine. He became the governor of Maine. He got the Congressional Medal of Honor. And one interesting story to me is that, excuse me, where did they surrender? When the, when the Civil War was all over, where did Robert E. Lee meet Grant to surrender? Appomattox Courthouse, where? What state? You know? I kind of mentioned it already today. It was General Lee's home state of Virginia. Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia, okay? Now, who did General Grant choose of all the generals in the whole Union Army to accept the surrender papers. Colonel Joshua Chamberlain is now a general because of his battle of Gettysburg. He 
he accepts the papers of surrender from Robert E. Lee because of his work. If he hadn't defended this hill, you say, man, that's kind of a lot of pressure. Yeah, you'll see it in the movie. If they hadn't defended this hill, they'd have probably lost the Battle of Gettysburg. Since he defended it and they won, he was chosen out of all the Union officers to receive the surrender papers. Now, that's not the end of the story. I'll get to your question just a second. Just a second. Who? Appomattox Courthouse. A-P-P-A-M-A-T-T-O-X. Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia. Now, had General Lee walked out of the Appomattox Courthouse, he was going to get on his horse, ride back to Virginia, to his farm, plantation, whatever he had, and live out the rest of his life in defeat. General Chamberlain, who accepted the papers, commanded his Union men at Appomattox Courthouse to salute Robert E. Lee. What do you think they said? What do you think the officers said? Take a guess. Either yes or no. <laughs> no. He said no. Absolutely. He said, gentlemen, this man is a great man. He's a great general. And he deserves our respect and honor. And those Union officers saluted Robert E. Lee because Colonel Chamberlain man of great character. You'll see in the movie, he picked up on a few different things, how great a man of character he is. Um, so, they had the fight. Each side lost 10,000 men on the second day. Now, one thing you need to know about the movie. I've watched the movie several times. They cannot depict the horror of real war in a movie. They could not show you in a movie what really happened. I read a story about a nurse that was at uh, General Meade's headquarters, which is, is Meade's over here, you know, on this side, and his headquarters is back here on this little hill, and there's a little hospital back here. A nurse reported that she took care of a Union soldier who had both arms blown off and both legs blown off. Both legs blown off. The only thing that was left of his torso was the guy was still alive. They can't show that kind of stuff, but they can kind of show you what might happen, but they can't show you the real horror and the blood and the guts and the devastation of war in a movie like that. How many of you saw Braveheart? That was gory and bloody, right? But even there, they can't show you the horror of what really happens in war. Now, on the end of the, on the end of the second day, General Meade meets at his headquarters with his officers and says, I think we should retreat. Lee's going to throw everything he can at us. It will kind of retreat back toward uh, Gettysburg, kind of retreat back toward Washington, kind of defend, then we'll be okay. And his officer said, no, we're not retreating this, this field of battle. So what they decided was, well, Lee has attacked us on the flank. He's attacked us on the flank. Tomorrow, he's going to attack us right in the middle. And they were exactly right. Third day of battle on July 3rd, the Confederates lined up on Cemetery Ridge. The Union lined up on Cemetery Ridge, and there's a there's a clump of trees which are still on the battlefield, by the way. You can go there and see it. There's a clump of trees, and General Lee said, "I want you to converge in the middle at that clump of trees, and if we can divide the forces, then we can." push out like this and conquer them, divide and conquer them. Well, it didn't work, and I'll tell you why it didn't work. The battle started on the third day at 1 p.m. The Confederates had 140 cannons. The Union had 110 cannons, and they started firing these 250 cannons back and forth across this field at each other for an hour. Smoke, killing, you know, knocking out equipment, horses, men, whatever. At 2 o'clock, the Union decided to play a trick on the uh, Confederates. They pulled some of their cannons, and there's like a little ridge here, so it's a hill bike here, you can't see. So in the smoke and stuff, under guise, they pulled their cannons, some of their cannons off the field. Well, what do you think the Union thought? That what? That they were knocked out some of their cannons, right? And so therefore, they thought, Let's begin the attack now because their cannons are some of their cannons are knocked out. We have an advantage. So at two o'clock, 
the order was given. Now, you'll see in the movie, here, here's an interesting point in the movie. General Lee told, I'm sorry, <clears throat> General Longstreet told Lee when he was given the plan of battle of going across here, it's called Pickett's Charge. They're going to send all these men, like 50,000 men or so, across this field and attack you know, the middle of the Union forces over here and try to defeat them. And General Longstreet told General Lee, he said, no amount of men could charge across that field and win the battle. It's impossible. So he really did not want to participate in the battle, and he would not give the order for his men to charge across that field. So you'll see in the movie, upright General Pickett on his horse, General! Give the command to attack. Are we going to attack now? We need to, we need to attack. And General Longstreet just sitting there like this. Because he's he knows it's not going to work. He knows it's, gonna, it's a suicide mission. And so finally, Pickett says, let us attack now. And General Longstreet just kind of drops his head like this. Well, what do you think General Pickett thought that was? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Well, he, he wasn't. He was, he was so devastated by the thought sending his men across this field. And see, that's what first got me interested in this whole procedure. Why would General Lee send these men across that field in the face of this defended position in the certain suicide and slaughter? Well, they didn't, they didn't win the, the field that day. The men came back across the field, Robert and Lee met them and apologized to them. And they then began to retreat went back across the Potomac River into Virginia. General Meade and his troops decided not to pursue them. Now, if it had been me, and I was Meade, and we'd won this day's battle, I would have followed them down and tried to just wipe them out. But it was like, we won the day, there's no use, you know, killing all the men, enough bloodshed. Now, in the battle, this is kind of finishing up here, in the three-day battle, 28,000 Confederates were lost. 28,000 men either died were wounded or captured. 28,000 in three days. On the Union side, 23,000 wounded, killed, or captured. 51,000 men in three days. Any of you know anything about the Vietnam War? How many men and women died in Vietnam in 10 years? Anybody know? Ballpark idea? 50,000 in 10 years. So this was perhaps the bloodiest, one of the bloodiest battles of the Civil War, one of the most pivotal battles in the Civil War. 51,000 men were, were knocked out in this battle. Now, interesting fact, you may not know this, but Jeb Stewart finally showed up on July 2nd, real late at night. He finally showed up. He was over here messing around. He finally shows up. Lee really gets, gets him, gives it to him. And then he decides, okay, I've got to redeem myself somehow, so I'm going to, I'm going to have my own battle. So he gets all his men together, and over here behind this battle that's taking place between the two ridges, um, he fights against General Armstrong Custer. Anybody ever heard of Custer? <coughs> Custer's Last Stand, Battle of the Little Bighorn, Sioux Nation. Well, General Armstrong Custer led the Union Cavalry against Jeb Stewart's Cavalry in a battle and behind the battle here at Gettysburg. When I went to Gettysburg, I wanted to kind of sense what it was like for those men that were hiding on that third day of battle before they started that charge. And there's a ridge here, and there's a, a, like trees and forest kind of thing, and they were kind of like hiding. They were hiding down. They were sending cannonballs over, you know, trying to knock them out. And then the call came to, to rise up and go into battle, and you'll see it in the movie. They just they start lining up. As they came, there's a little hill there, like a little rise. As they came up on that hill out of those woods, I did that myself because I wanted to see what did those guys see? What did they feel? What did they think? And they came up out of those woods onto that little hill, and they looked across the battlefield, and they saw the Union troops scattered in a certain situation where they knew they couldn't win. I'm sure that those men thought, I'm going to die today. Now, what would you have done? Would you have gone ahead knowing you were going to die? Some ran, but most fought because they were fighting for their own honor and their state and the Confederate.
Confederacy, and so those men marched across that field and they were just slaughtered. One thing about cannon fire that you need to know, a lot of times we think, well, they just shot cannonballs. They explode, people die. You see that in the movie. They also shot what they call canister, C-A-N-I-S-T-E-R, canister. They would take a can, like we would use like a paint can or something, coffee can, and they would stuff nails in it and glass and bits of metal. They would stuff those down in the cannons, and when the troops got real close, they'd fire them. Well, what do you think would happen? Well, what would be the effect of that kind of gunshot? What would it be like shooting? Well, it cut them and go into their bodies and eyes and, you know. Some of the men that were closest to the cannons would just get cut in half. It was like taking a sword and cutting them in half because the blast of that, that material coming at them. Again, you know, you can't, you can't even imagine the horrors of war. We've never been in war in this country, and I'm very thankful for that. When I went to um, Liberia, West Africa a few months ago, I can't imagine what it was like for people to go through seven years of civil war. It's just, it's just devastating what happens to people and their families and friends and those kind of things. So, five factors that I'll finish up with today very quickly. Why the Confederates lost the Battle of Gettysburg and therefore the Civil War. Jeff Stewart and his cavalry were not at the battle for the first two days. Jeff Stewart was the guy that was over here messing around. Stonewall Jackson had been killed at Chancellorsville. He was a very important general to General Lee. He was knocked out, killed. Had he been at the Battle of Gettysburg, they would have won the day right here. When Buford retreated, they would have advanced in. I think they would have captured before the Union forces came up. General Lee's pride. General Lee had never lost a battle to the Union before. And he thought they were going to win. He thought, I'm going to send those men across that field, and they're going to cut them in two, and they're going to wipe them out, and we're going to win. We're going to end the war. Fourth critical factor was John Buford and his cavalry on that first day. If he hadn't been there and hadn't stacked them up, the Confederates would have had the high ground. And then fifthly, as I said before, if Joe Hooker had been the general of the Confederate forces instead of George Meade, who was appointed by Lincoln three days before the battle, General Meade was there and they won the battle. If Hooker had been there, I don't think they would have. Okay, any questions? Anything? Yes? Oh, well, see, Lee was headed up here to Carlisle, Harrisburg, Baltimore, Washington. And here's, here's the Army of the Potomac kind of defending Washington. So it could have happened anyway. Turn this stuff on. And this is what happened. When they came in that first day, they ran into cavalry, but the battle started. They did not plan to fight them. What did I do there? Thank okay. you for sharing your knowledge with us. It's very interesting. Yay! Children are good. Make sure she's going into the right back.